honor to welcome Dr. Peter Kuznick, who will be speaking on Donald J. Trump. <laughs> um, I presume most of you have heard the name. <laughs> Peter is the director of the Nuclear Studies Institute and professor in the Department of History at American University. He received his doctorate in 1984 from Rutgers. He's probably best known for working with Oliver Stone on a Showtime series on the history of the United States, and the two of them also put out a book entitled The Untold History of the United States. His doctoral dissertation was called Beyond, which was published in, by the University of Chicago. It's called Beyond the Laboratory, Scientists and Political Activity in 1930s America. He is also co-author of Rethinking the Atomic Bomb of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he has been active in civil rights, anti-Vietnam War, nuclear abolition. He co was the co-founder of the committee for the national discussion of nuclear history. Please welcome Peter Kuss. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, can everybody hear me okay in the back? <clears throat> okay, I've been given the unenviable task of talking about Donald Trump's foreign policy. <laughs> Talk about hitting a moving target. Uh, Nietzsche once said, in individuals, insanity is rare. But in parties, in groups, parties, nations, and epochs, it is the rule. <laughs> Uh, what I hope to do today is show the myriad ways in which Trump's malign, dangerous, and reckless policies are not really, or not entirely, outside mainstream bipartisan U.S. foreign policy as it's been conducted through the years since World War II, but that Trump nevertheless poses a serious threat to peace, security, and the continued existence of life on this planet. I've been to Russia, I, to Moscow, I went to Moscow four times during the campaign, and I was back there again a couple weeks ago. And I participated in conferences, in symposia, I spoke at four universities, I did more than 50 interviews with Russian television networks, and the discussion always came back to the U.S. presidential election. <laughs> On that topic, I disagreed with almost all of my Russian colleagues. Almost all the political and scholar, politician and scholars I knew in Russia were supporting Donald Trump throughout the campaign. I would often be the only person at a conference taking the opposite position. Uh, when I spoke to students at the universities, I would invariably begin by asking them, how many supported Trump and how many supported Clinton? And the answer I would get from the, at the top universities was about 85% to 90% supported Trump. The only place I got the opposite was in Mgimo. Mgimo is the university that trains Russian diplomats. And there they were 80% in favor of Clinton. But for the most part, the Russians were overwhelmingly in favor of Trump. And they opposed Clinton because she, they thought she was hostile to Russia. Uh, they agreed with Putin that she interfered in the, 2000, uh, in the elections in 2011, 2012, that she mobilized opposition to Putin. Uh, they saw her, uh, as I did, uh, what, I, what I explained to my Russian colleagues was that if you have to choose between a militarist, a hawk like Clinton, and a potential madman like Trump, you've got to choose the militarist. And Clinton certainly was that. And she supported the invasion of Afghanistan, supported the invasion of Iraq, supported the overthrow in Libya, supported the bombing in Syria. There really hasn't been a war that Hillary Clinton hasn't been able to embrace. And her policies, you know, we'll get more into the Russian question later, but this, it was a very serious situation. When Clinton was calling for a no-strike zone, a no-fly zone over Syria, General Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that this would lead to war with Russia. She also supported the NATO buildup in the Baltics. 
uh, the uh, uh, missile defense in Romania and Poland. She uh, was hard line on Ukraine. So across the board, Clinton was very hostile to Russia. Uh, that still doesn't make her more dangerous than Donald Trump. But I told my Russian colleagues, be careful what you wish for. Because Donald Trump, you're much better off with somebody who's reasonable and sane and militaristic than you are with somebody who's as unhinged, unstable, impulsive, and reckless as Donald Trump. And now we know that most Russians, uh, the Russian leadership has pretty much come around and agrees with that position and has repudiated what they had said before. Uh, the free, uh, I want to talk first about some bipartisan foreign policy. For years, Democrats and Republicans have been supporting bipartisan foreign policy without a lot of difference between the two sides. A lot of difference over domestic issues, less difference over foreign policy issues. Oliver Stone and I began our Untold History of the United States project back in 2008, we started writing in 2008, uh, because we were trying to assess whether or not George W. Bush represented an aberration. Was Bush within mainstream of American policy with the things he was doing, or did he represent an aberration? And so we started to trace it back. We begin really in the 1890s. So we look at the uh, Spanish-American War. We look at the US intervention against Aguinaldo in the Philippines. The first time we directly intervened to overthrow a popular democratically elected administration in the Philippines. We trace it through the US interventions, uh, US interventions throughout uh, Latin America in the subsequent years, uh, and then to World War II, and the real start of the American empire. Uh, so uh, what we found is that there are certain principles that have guided American foreign policy thinking throughout the 20th century. And the first one is the idea of American exceptionalism. Right, we can trace this one back to Winthrop's sermon aboard the Arbella in Massachusetts Bay in 1630. And it says America will be as a city upon a hill, and all the eyes will be upon us. We can trace it to Woodrow Wilson's comment after Versailles. It says now the world will know America as the savior of the world. We can look at Madeleine Albright, who said if we have to use force, it's because we're America. We're the indispensable nation. We stand taller and see farther than other nations into the future. We can trace it to Hillary Clinton, who says, we're the indispensable nation. We're the force for progress, prosperity, and peace. Uh, we, uh, Obama, when Obama welcomed the troops home at Fort Bragg, troops from, from Iraq, uh, Obama said that he commended them for their willingness to sacrifice so much for people that you had never met, which he said was part of what makes us special as Americans. Unlike the old empires, we don't make these sacrifices for territory or for resources. We do it because it's right. A unique willingness among nations to pay a great price for the progress of human freedom and dignity. This is who we are. That's what, what, that's what, that's what we do as Americans. With Alan Greenspan, the head of the Federal Reserve, who said uh, that he thought that statement was absurd. He said, I'm saddened that it is politically inconvenient to acknowledge what everyone knows that the Iraq war is largely about oil. But Obama, as much as the others, was drinking the Kool-Aid, supporting this idea of American exceptionalism, the idea that the United States is different from all other nations, that other nations are motivated by greed, territorial <coughs> gain, geopolitical advantage, but the United States does it because we want to spread freedom and democracy around the world. That's a very much of a bipartisan notion. A second notion that's disturbingly bipartisan uh, is, is the commitment to American hegemony. On November 9th, 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, American leaders praised Gorbachev's restraint in not intervening in the Eastern European affairs. It didn't take us long, however. Uh, we just read about the death of, Ma of uh, Noriega in Panama. Well, on December 20th, 1989, uh, uh, the Bush, first Bush administration made it clear that it was not going to be deterred by a Russian restraint, and we invaded Panama. Uh, the death of, that, of Noriega put this issue back on the front page of the newspapers a couple days ago. So, but the U.S. showed that it would act unilaterally. In defiance of world opinion, the OAS voted 20 to 1 
to deeply deplore the invasion. Colin Powell said, we have to put a shingle outside our door saying superpower lives here no matter what the Soviets do. In 1990, Charles Krauthammer laid out his vision for a neocon foreign policy in his Henry M. Jackson Memorial Lecture to the American Enterprise Institute. It was titled The Unipolar Moment. Krauthammer concluded that the best hope for safety in these abnormal times is American strength and will to lead a unipolar world unashamedly laying down the rules of world order and being prepared to enforce them. In 1997, Robert Kagan and Bill Kristol organized a project for a new American century based on putting that vision into effect. Now, they got the idea of the new American century because it was Henry Luce in 1941 who announced the birth of the first American century. Luce, the head of the Time Life Empire, said in his editorial, that the United States is going to dominate the world, economically, politically, militarily, culturally. It's going to be the American century. And he was challenged by Henry Wallace. Wallace was the vice president at the time, a man who's been written out of history. And Wallace made a speech called The Century of the Common Man. And Wallace says it shouldn't be the American century, it should be the century of the common man. And Wallace called for a worldwide people's revolution in the tradition of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Latin American Revolutions. He called for an end to imperialism, an end to colonialism, spreading the fruits of science and industry around the globe. Wallace was a visionary. Had Wallace's vision prevailed, and it came very close, we would have had a different world. In 1944, when Roosevelt was up for, his, running for his fourth term, the question was, who was he going to put back on the ticket? Was it going to be Wallace as vice president, or was it going to be somebody else? The party bosses were opposed to Wallace. He had a lot of enemies. His enemies included the business community, because Wallace said that America's fascists are those who think Wall Street comes first and the American people second. Now we call them Democrats or Republicans, but Wallace called them America's fascists. So the business community was opposed to him, and Wallace was the leading proponent of American labor. The Southern segregationists were opposed to him. He was the leading proponent of black civil rights in the party. The anti-feminists were opposed to him. He was the leading proponent of women's rights. The British and the French hated him because he was the leading critic of British and French colonialism. So Wallace had a lot of enemies, uh, but he had a lot of support. And so the, the, even though the party bosses had organized to get Wallace off the ticket in 44, the first night of the convention, July 20th, 1944, steamy evening in Chicago, Wallace made the seconding speech for Roosevelt. The place went wild. The problem was that Wallace was enormously popular with the American people, second most popular man in America. The day the convention started, Gallup released a poll asking potential voters who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 65% said they wanted Wallace as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman. So the question is, how do we get stuck with Harry Truman? Uh, the party bosses had the convention rigged for Truman. They kept out the Wallace delegates, but there was a, Wallace made the second speech for Roosevelt. There was an immediate, <coughs> spontaneous demonstration. Went on for an hour, led by Hubert Humphrey and Adlai Stevenson. Uh, and Claude Pepper, sitting in the middle of the, of the auditorium, realized that if he could get to the microphone, get Wallace's name and nomination, Wallace would sweep the convention, be back on the ticket as vice president, uh, and defy the party bosses. Pepper started to fight his way through the crowd, got within five feet of the microphone. Mayor Kelly and the other bosses are screaming, is a fire hazard adjourned immediately? Sam Jacks was chairing it, he wasn't sure what to do. He said, I have a motion to adjourn, all in favor say aye, maybe 5% said aye. All the posts said nay, 95% said nay. Jackson said, motion carried, meeting adjourned. Pepper was five feet from the microphone. Had Pepper gotten those five feet from the, mic the microphone, and got Wallace's name and nomination. Wallace would have been back, become president on April 12, 1945, instead of Truman. And I think there would have been no atomic bombings. I'm sure there were no atomic bombings, and probably no Cold War. So history came very, very close to changing. So when they're talking about the project for a new American century, they're talking about a vision for American hegemony. They pulled a coup off in 2000 and got Bush somehow into the White House, even though he didn't win the election. And then they began to implement their plans. And as people here all know, 
The program in 2000 said that we have to build up America's defenses, and if we, uh, in order to do that quickly like we need, we're going to need a new Pearl Harbor. And they got their new Pearl Harbor on 9-11, and they jumped Im immediately into action. Uh, they, the neoconservative thinkers targeted, after the invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, they targeted seven other countries for regime change. And those countries included Libya, Syria, Iraq, and North Korea. So we're still dealing with those issues. Iran also, right? Yes, Iraq and Iran, right. uh, and North Korea. And from Somalia and Sudan, we've got a few others also. Uh, the, uh, so the American empire is very different than the European empires. It's not like the old colonial empires. The United States has what Chalmers Johnson called an empire of bases. We've got a network of 800 bases, maybe more, around the world. Uh, but we did start to acknowledge that this was a real empire. You might recall the Sunday Times Magazine section headline on January 5th, 2003, American Empire, get used to it. All the neocons were coming out of the woodwork and saying, finally, this is not only an empire, it's the greatest empire in all history. Uh, so this is a, and this, at this time, that, that so Krauthammer, uh, beginning in 1990, with the collapse, with the uh, Berlin Wall and the changes in the Soviet Union, Krauthammer wrote, and this is America's unipolar moment, uh, that, that the United States now has no rival in the world, that the goal for us is to maintain this position of unipolarity. After the United States invaded Afghanistan, and devastated Afghanistan, Krauthammer was so thrilled, he says, the unipolar moment, he said in 1990, I was talking about maybe American unipolarity lasting 30 or 40 years. He says, now we're talking about the unipolar era. It's indefinite. American unipolarity will not have a rival in the world for the foreseeable future, for decades, maybe for centuries. Uh, so that was Krauthammer and the neocons were feeling their exuberance at that point and their certainty in their victory. But by 2006, Krauthammer was saying America's unipolar moment has ended. And in 2005, after the disaster in Iraq, that American unipolarity was no longer, uh, no longer uh, in, in effect. So, but, but this idea of American century, even Obama says in, uh, in 2011, we are perfectly poised to make the 21st century again the American century. So another principle then is American hegemony and domination. The third principle is the use of force. This is undergirded by partisan foreign policy throughout the 20th century. As Samuel Huntington said, and I don't usually agree with Huntington, but Huntington was right on one thing, and he said that uh, the West won the world not by the superiority of its ideas or <laughs> values or religion, but by the superior application of organized violence. Westerners sometimes forget that fact. Non-Westerners never do. And what was the use of organized violence? That what was the most egregious use of organized violence? Of course, the atomic bombings in 1945, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a, in a few minutes. Uh, the United States didn't only use atomic bombs twice, as most people think. As my friend Dan Ellsberg likes to say, the United States has used atomic bombs repeatedly in the same sense that a robber holding a gun to someone's head uses that gun without pulling the trigger. This has been the underpinnings of American foreign policy, the idea of might makes right. And what did we do with that? We escalated so much in terms of the buildup of atomic bombs in the late 60s and then again in the 80s that we create that by that point there were 70,000 atomic bomb nuclear weapons in the world. 70,000. I take students every summer on a study abroad class in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I, every year I find myself invariably writing down the same information at the Atomic Bomb Museum in Hiroshima. It said that by 1985, the world had reached the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. What kind of insanity was going on? 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. How many times do we have to be able to 
uh, destroy to end all life on the planet before we're satisfied. <coughs> Which brings me finally to uh, talking about Donald Trump. Uh, tr Trump has does ha now that's the difficulty about talking about Trump's foreign policy is of course it's constantly changing. I don't know how many people <coughs> saw the news this morning, but I'll get to that in a couple minutes. The latest outrages. Uh, but Trump does have some core beliefs, and I wanted to identify them first. He believes that America is in economic and military, de military decline because other nations take unfair advantage of U.S. generosity and that American interests should come first, uh, as he calls it, America first. He, say, he says that that will put an end to decades of losing and we were going to start winning again. He says that U.S. allies have not been paying adequately for protection. Obama also made the same point, but not quite as offensively as Trump. So Trump believes that the United States has been getting screwed in all of its trade deals since World War II. He sees trade as a zero-sum game with winners and losers, not as a mutually beneficial interchange. So the United States needs tariff protection. He threatened to slap a 45% tariff on Chinese imports. He's talking again today about German imports. Uh, he pulled out of TPP on his first day in office, which I think is a good thing. He threatened similar action with NAFTA, and he reneged after calls from Canada and Mexico. He thinks that Germany is taking unfair advantage of the US, bad, very bad, he called the Germans last week. Uh, he says the EU is the tool that Germany used to beat the United States on trade. <coughs> Another principle of Trump's foreign policy, he likes authoritarian rulers. And then whatever form that comes in, it could be Putin, or Duterte, or Erdogan, or El Sisi, or Xi, or Netanyahu, or Viktor Orban in Hungary, or Abe. Uh, he wants a way to war against radical Islam. He considers an existential threat to the United States. Uh, he sides with, as we saw last week in his trip to the Middle East, he sided completely with the Sunni Gulf Arabs against the Iranian Shiites, despite the uh, Saudis propagating their dangerous version of Wahhabi Islam. <clears throat> His Islamophobia is shared by Pompeo, Pence, Mattis, Bannon, Flynn, and others in that administration. He called uh, Mattis, for example, is thought to be one of the adults in the room, told Obama in 2010 that the top three threats to the United States were number one, Iran, number two, Iran, and number three, Iran. Uh, last April, Mattis told reporters, everywhere you look, if there's trouble in the region, you find Iran. So, and, and that's the view that Trump has been taking. Uh, he said it, the Iran nuclear deal is the worst deal ever negotiated. He says one of the worst deals ever made by any country in history, that the U.S. is getting nothing out of this, that Iran's getting $150 billion, and they're going to get a bomb. This was echoed by Flynn, it was echoed by Spicer. Uh, so uh, we'll get more into this. Rouhani, who just got, that's the, one of the ironies, of course, of Trump's visit and denouncing Iran, was that Rouhani got overwhelmingly reelected <coughs> as president in Iran in a democratic election there, and Rouhani commented, Mr. Trump arrived in the region at the time when he saw 45 million Iranians participating in the elections. Then he visited a country that I doubt knows the definition of elections. The poor things have never seen a ballot box. Uh, but uh, Trump says that uh, Saudi Arabia is our, our ally there, Iran is our enemy, and we're going to uh, do what we have to do to stop them. Uh, he's also a strong proponent of military force. He says, what I do is I authorize my military, we've given them total authorization, and that's what they're doing, and frankly, that's why they've been so successful lately. So uh, Trump uh, dropped the mother of all bombs in Afghanistan. There's been a sharp increase in drone attacks, and we'll get later to what's going on in Korea. Uh, so with all of that as backdrop, in March 2016, 50 senior Republican foreign policy advisors, uh, the, the other Republican foreign policy experts, issued a statement repudiating Donald Trump. And their indictment is quite, quite interesting. I want to go through it. Uh, they wrote, 
Quote, the undersigned individuals have all served in senior national security or foreign policy positions in Republican administrations, from Nix Richard Nixon to George W. Bush. Actually, most have worked in the George W. Bush administration, uh, which is not much of a recommendation. But uh, they say, none of us will vote for Donald Trump. From a foreign policy perspective, Donald Trump is not qualified to be president and commander-in-chief. Indeed, we are convinced that he would be a dangerous president and would put our country at risk, put our, at risk our country's national security and well-being. Most fundamentally, Trump lacks the character, values, and experience to be president. He weakens U.S. moral authority as the leader of the free world. He appears to lack basic knowledge about and belief in the U.S. Constitution, U.S. laws, and U.S. institutions, including religious tolerance, freedom of the press, and an independent judiciary. In addition, Mr. Trump has demonstrated repeatedly that he has little understanding of America's vital national interests, its complex diplomatic challenges, its indispensable alliances, and the democratic values on which U.S. foreign policy must be based. Unlike previous presidents who have limited experience of foreign affairs, Mr. Trump has shown no interest in educating himself. He continues to display an alarming ignorance of basic facts of contemporary international politics. Mr. Trump lacks the temperament to be president. In our experience, the president must be willing to listen to his advisors and department heads, must encourage consideration <laughs> of conflicting views, must acknowledge errors and learn from them. A president must be disciplined, control emotions, and act only after reflection and careful deliberation. A president must maintain cordial relationships with leaders of countries of different backgrounds, must have their respect and trust. In our judgment, Mr. Trump has none of these critical qualities. He is unable, unwilling to separate truth from falsehood. He doesn't encourage conflicting views. He lacks self-control and acts impetuously. He cannot tolerate personal criticism. He has alarmed our closest allies with his erratic behavior. All of these are dangerous qualities in an individual who aspires to be president and commander-in-chief with command of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. We are convinced that in the Oval Office, he would be the most reckless president in American history. That was a pretty scathing indictment. Uh, I agree with all of the criticisms, but I would add a few more condemnable traits. Uh, he is racist, bigoted, nativist, and xenophobic. He is misogynistic. He is coarse and vulgar. He's dangerously militaristic. He uses the office for personal financial gain. And he is pathologically narcissistic. Uh, Elliot Cohn was one of the people who signed that. Elliot Cohn uh, then started to have second thoughts. And he said, said to all these public and establishment figures, well, maybe we shouldn't shun the Trump administration. Uh, he said, uh, he urged the other Republicans to work with Trump in the national interest. But then he quickly did an about face and he tweeted, after exchange with Trump's transition team, I changed my recommendation. Stay away. They're angry, arrogant, screaming, you lost. This is going to be ugly. And we know that this has certainly been ugly. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to do is go point by point through this Republican critique <coughs> and show that not only are these traits not unique to Trump, but many of them have been uh, actually uh, actually engaged in more dangerously by other American presidents. So in a sense, I want to mainstream Trump so that we can assess whether or not he really does fit in the mainstream. As a Trump psychobiographer, I have to agree with most of what you said, but I'm interested in your giving us some psychohistorical insights. We should hold off any questions or comments till he's finished. We'll get, we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, so number one. Trump lacks the uh, character, values, and experience to be president. It's certainly true of Trump, but it's hardly unique to Trump. The most glaring example is one you probably won't choose, and that's Harry Truman. <clears throat> when Harry Truman, Harry Truman, we'll go into too, we don't have time to go into too much history, but when he got elected to the Senate in 1934, after being a functionary for the corrupt Pendergast machine, a reporter asked Boss Pendergast why he chose Harry Truman, of all people, to run for the Senate. And Pendergast responded, I wanted to demonstrate 
that a well-oiled machine could send an office boy to the Senate. During his first term in the Senate, Trump, Truman was uh, shunned by all the other senators. They, they called him the senator from Pendergast. They would have nothing to do with him. When he ran for re-election in 1940, Roosevelt refused to back him. Pendergast was in federal prison in Kansas City, and he was coming in third. He turned to the Hannigan-Dickman machine, the corrupt machine that ran St. Louis, and they backed him, and he barely eked out uh, the victory in 1940. During the second term, he developed a little bit of a national reputation when he <coughs> investigated the defense industry. When he got chosen to replace Wallace on the ticket by the party bosses in 1940, they paid no attention to his qualifications. He gets back, he gets on the ticket, he's vice president for 82 days. During that time, he spoke to Roosevelt twice, but about nothing of consequence. When Truman became president on April 12, 1945, he did not even know the United States was building an atomic bomb. It wasn't until after he was sworn in. Nobody had enough regard for him to even tell him we were building an atomic bomb. Truman immediately gets us in trouble, uh, based on not, not because he's a bad guy, but he simply <coughs> had the wrong instincts and made the wrong decisions. Roosevelt's last cable to Churchill said that these issues between us and the Soviets seem to crop up every day and they get worked out. We shouldn't make a big deal about it. Truman, by, would get his first hand office April 13th, by April 23rd, he's meeting with Molotov. He accuses Molotov of breaking all the Soviet agreements, especially over Poland, but over Eastern Europe and, and the Yalta agreements. Uh, and then he brags, I gave it to him one two to the jaw. Gave it to him one two to the jaw. Uh, so Truman uh, almost immediately reverses the policy on that. Truman, within the first 120 days, also drops the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, I, I have a 12-hour lecture on that topic that I won't <laughs> give you today. But, uh, but I will say that uh, just how do we make sense out of that? And the United States had eight five-star admirals and generals in 1945. Of, the, of those, seven are on record as saying that the atomic bombs were either militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. MacArthur, who's hardly a pacifist, said that the, so that the Japanese would have surrendered in June if we had told them they could keep the emperor. He actually says in May they would have surrendered if we told them they'd keep the emperor. Admiral Leahy, who was Prune's personal chief of staff, said this put us on our level of the barbarians of the Dark Ages. Eisenhower, all of them, uh, echoed the same thing. So in terms of inexperience, Trump is certainly inexperienced, but his inexperience has not been as damaging yet as Truman's inexperience. <coughs> Recklessness, sure, Trump is reckless, guilty as charged, uh, but again, we have no shortage of reckless presidents. George W. Bush was the poster child for recklessness. We're still dealing with the consequences of Bush's recklessness, but again, Harry Truman takes the cake. And again, to put it in the context of nuclear issues, what Truman understood was that he was not just developing and using a bigger, more powerful bomb, he was beginning a process that could end all life on the planet. He says throw on a, so on at least three occasions. On April 13th, April 25th, July 25th. On July 25th, when he gets the results of the Almogordo test, he said, writes in his journal, this may be the fire destruction prophecy in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. Truman was very aware that he was beginning a process that could end all life on the planet. If we want to psychoanalyze somebody, we can try to figure out why would somebody like Truman uh, use the bomb when he knew that he was doing it exactly the way that posed the greatest threat to all of mankind. Uh, <clears throat> number three, uh, that this would weaken U.S. moral authority. Well, Trump has made a laughing stock out of the United States around the world. I'm just back from Spain a couple weeks ago after about went to Russia and then Spain. And I spoke about Trump in Spain. And uh, they get the same reaction everywhere now that Trump is a huge embarrassment to the United States. Uh, his, uh, his recent trip, he ingratiated himself with repressive autocrats of the Sunni world. He antagonized America's European allies. Germany's financial paper, Handelsblatt, called him the boring chief. Lamone described him as brutal and heavy-handed. 
But again, he's not the first to weaken U.S. moral authority around the world. Uh, not much of that authority was left after the U.S. invasion of Vietnam or during the Eisenhower administration. Eisenhower terrified the world. The Bravo test in 1954, which contaminated the sailors above the Lucky Dragon 5 fishing trawler, the response to that in 1954 when Belgian diplomat Henry Spock warned America was becoming synonymous with Europe and Europe with barbarism and horror. Indian Prime Minister Nehru called U.S. leaders dangerously self-centered lunatics who would blow up any people or country who came in the way of their policy. Eisenhower told the National Security Council in 1954, everyone seems to think we are skunks, saber rattlers, and warmongers. Dulles added, we are losing ground every day in England and other allied nations because they're all insisting that we're so militaristic. Comparisons are now being made between ours and Hitler's military machine. Uh, do we know what happened after George and the United States invaded Iraq? In 2003, Time Magazine did a survey of 300,000 Europeans, found that 84% considered the U.S. the greatest threat to world peace, 8% considered Iraq to be the greatest threat to world peace. Among Pakistanis, 15% had a favorable view of the United States, 23% had a favorable view of arch enemy India, who the Pakistanis hate. Uh, so uh, we could go now to the, the data about the Europeans th thinking about Trump, uh, the, uh, der, uh, der, the, the Welt reported that only 22% of uh, Europeans in February thought the United States was a trustworthy ally, down from 59% three months earlier. So uh, clearly on that, Trump is guilty, but is he more guilty than others? I don't think so. Respect for constitutional safeguards and freedom of the press. Uh, Trump has no respect for the Constitution or the press. He said that NY, the New York Times and ABC and CBS and CNN and NBC are the enemy of the American people. He dismissed them as the fake news media. He said the press has been so dishonest, the level of dishonesty is out of control. He incited hatred against the press at his campaign rallies. He encouraged crowds to boo, insult, and intimidate reporters. But how different is that than, say, Richard Nixon? Nixon was a little bit less public about it, but uh, during the Watergate scandal, he said to the press, don't get the impression that you aroused my anger. You see, the old one can only be angry with those he respects. He told Kissinger, the press is the enemy. Uh, he ordered Attorney General John Mitchell to wire to tap, tap and harass hostile journalists. He threatened to sue the New York Times. He unleashed Spiro Agnew uh, 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 to uh, go after the press. And we know what uh, Agnew did. But it wasn't just Nixon, it was also Bush and Obama who had little respect for the press or for civil liberties. Bush passed, through, passed the Patriot Act and engaged in illegal surveillance, but Obama doubled down on Bush's usurpation of power. He declared a war on leakers. Between 1917 and 2008, three people had been indicted under the Espionage Act for leaking. Obama himself indicted eight people under the Espionage Act for leaking. Under Obama, if you exposed war crimes like Chelsea Manning, you brought it in jail. If you committed them like Bush and Cheney, you walked free. But, and people recognize that, uh, Obama's attack on civil liberties. Bush's Justice Department <coughs> official Jack Goldsmith took issue with, with uh, Cheney for attacking Obama. Uh, Goldsmith said, the truth is closer to the opposite. That the new administration has copied most of the Bush program, <coughs> has expanded some of it, has narrowed only a bit. Almost all the Obama changes have been at the level of packaging, argumentation, symbol, and rhetoric. The Obama <coughs> strategy can thus be seen as an attempt to make the core Bush approach to terrorism politically and legally more palatable and thus sustainable. Ari Fleischer, Bush's former press secretary, went even further. He told CNN, across the board, when you look at what Obama has done, he's continued so many of the Bush administration policies, from drone strikes to military commissions to wiretaps to renditions, you name it, he's doing it. It's like George Bush is having his fourth term. He's a hypocrite. He campaigned against President Bush. He said it was a violation of the Constitution to do these things. Uh, understanding of democratic values. I'm getting the signal here that I'm running out of time. 
Uh, we're not going to get through this whole list. Understanding of democratic values. Uh, clearly, uh, neither that he had, uh, Trump has little understanding of democratic values, as, as we know. But he's got a lot of company there. The United States, once the CIA, would, uh, in terms of interfering in elections, it's amazing to me. I turn on CNN, and I see four, four journalists sitting around the table saying that Russian interference in the U.S. election is an act of war. I said, well, what planet these people come from? Do they know any, his, any American history? The CIA, in, set up in 1947, immediately intervenes in the Italian election. If we go through the list of, of democratically elected popular governments that the United States has overthrown, or the list of uh, elections the U.S. has interfered in, we could go through, we'd be here all day. Uh, we could talk about, uh, we could talk about Iran in 53, Guatemala in 54, uh, uh, Brazil in 64, Greece, Dominican Republic, and Indonesia in 65, Chile in 74, Nicaragua in the 80s. We interfere constantly in other countries' elections. In 1965, when the Greeks threatened to overthrow the U.S.-backed right-wing dictatorship and install a progressive government, Lyndon Johnson upbraided the Greek ambassador. Listen to me, Mr. Ambassador, he exploded. Fuck your parliament and your constitution. America is an elephant. Cyprus is a flea. Greece is a flea. If these two fleas continue itching the elephant, they may just get whacked by the elephant's trunk. Whacked good. We pay a lot of good American dollars to the Greek, Mr. Ambassador. If your prime minister gives me talk about democracy, parliaments, and constitutions, he, his parliament, and his constitution may not last very long. Uh, lacking curiosity. Uh, I think that's about five more, that was still ten minutes for discussion. Lacking curiosity, uh, here we talk about, uh, they got a lot of people, of course, Bush was, was great. The way they prepared Trump for this overseas trip is quite funny. The New York Times said that uh, uh, even as he sat with briefing books, Jared Kushner was in charge, and the Times says, even as, as uh, he sat with briefing books and stacks of news clippings about global events, Mr. Trump has generally just skimmed through, according to several people familiar with his preparations. Instead, he is focused on the chaos swirling around the White House. In an attempt to capture his interest, aides threaded Mr. Trump's own name through the paragraphs of one of the two-page memos they wrote for him. The only way to get his attention. And they, uh, and they, they knew that, you know, tell, tell the other leaders uh, not to talk for 30 minutes. He's only got a 30-second attention span. Uh, but, but it was, but it was uh, Reagan, more than anybody, who only, not only lacked curiosity, but knew nothing. Total ignoramus. Uh, when, uh, when, when Carter tried to brief him about command and control of nuclear weapons, when, when Reagan was taking the White House, uh, Carter said Reagan didn't take any notes, didn't ask any questions. And so Carter said, well, maybe it's because he doesn't have a pad and pencil. So Carter gave him a pencil and pad. And still Reagan didn't take any notes. And Jody Powell and Carter said, this is the damnedest thing. We couldn't understand it. But Reagan was a complete ignoramus. Uh, and, one of my famous, but also mendacious, made things up. Uh, in 1983, he had a meeting with Israeli President Yitzhak Shamir, and he told Shamir uh, about the time when he was with the Army Signal Corps during World War II, and he went and he was there when they liberated the concentration camps. And he said he was so moved by it that he kept the film in case he ever ran into a Holocaust skeptic, so he could show him the film. Then he told the same story. Uh, to, uh, to others after him, Rabbi Heyer and others, and, uh, and then the word got out about this. It was printed in Mariv, the Israeli paper, and then Luke Cannon found out, and he said, Reagan nef never left the United States during World War II. The whole thing is concocted. Reagan concocted things constantly about the Chicago welfare queen, changed the numbers, but the story was about the greedy blacks who were stealing from hardworking whites. Uh, so again, Trump does these things, but so did others. I think the last thing I have to talk about is Trump's nuclear policies. Because this is where we really get down to what's really most dangerous about him. Uh, as Hillary Clinton said, a man who can be provoked by a tweet shouldn't have access to the nuclear codes. And I think that that's true. Uh, if we look at what, is, what he says about nuclear weapons. During the campaign, he said that if South Korea uh, Saudi Arabia and Japan want to develop nuclear, their own nuclear weapons, that's fine. Uh, they, should, they should do so. Nobody supports the kind of nuclear proliferation. He said during the campaign that uh, uh, 
he, he said that if, some, if ISIS hits us, of course we're going to hit back with a nuclear weapon. He said that, uh, what's the point of having these weapons if we can't use them? To most people, that means let's get rid of them. To Trump, that means let's find a way to use them. And that's been his strategy. When Bobby Knight endorsed him, this incredible endorsement back in, in Evansville, Indiana, Bobby Knight, the Indiana football basketball coach, said that, uh, that there have been three great presidents, and the greatest one, one of the three is Harry Truman. You have to remember that there are two American presidents whose names start with T-R-U-M, Trump and Truman. Uh, and, and, and so Bobby Knight, who can't spell that far, uh, said that Harry Truman, what a great man, he used nuclear weapons on Japan, that's what made him great, and Trump's going to do the same thing. And Trump said, wow, what a treasure Bobby Knight is, what a great man, you know, and, and endorsing him and, and supporting him and smiling. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, you know, you know, we've got the situation with, uh, situation with <coughs> North Korea that I hope we'll get to talk about. Jacqueline Kennedy, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, wrote to Nikita Khrushchev, and she said that you and my husband were allied in the determination that the world should not be blown up. The danger which troubled my husband was that war might be started not so much by the big men as by the little ones. While big men know the need for self-control and restraint, little men are sometimes moved by fear and pride. We've got two little men facing off over the Korean situation. Neither one of them wants to back down. And, and they're both provoking each other. It's a very, very dangerous situation. And there are a lot of dangerous situations uh, that I hope we have a little bit of time to talk about. So Trump, what is, so in the final assessment, I was gonna say a lot more, but the final assessment, it's like with the diagnosis of uh, uh, narcissism. Uh, they, uh, they list nine traits, you people know more about this than I do, uh, nine traits uh, of, for, of the narcissist. And, the, and if, five, if you have five of them, you're supposed to be diagnosed as pathologically narcissistic. Well, Trump's got all nine traits. And the same thing with, with, with this indictment by the Republican foreign policy official. It's not that other presidents didn't do a lot of these things, didn't do some of them more destructively and more egregiously and more flagrantly. It's that Trump has got all of them. Whereas some presidents, a Truman or a Johnson or a Bush, would have had a handful of these traits, Trump has got all these traits. And that what makes him so unstable, so impulsive, so reckless. You might have seen the news this morning, it wasn't in the paper, it was on television, that Trump has announced that he's pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords. I mean, how outrageous can you be? How much can you be willing to sacrifice the future? Uh, and, and that's what we're dealing with here, with Trump. So somebody who's reckless, impulsive, unhinged, uh, militaristic, uh, self-centered, narcissistic, uh, we've got, got it all going here, which raises the question, what do we do? Because you've got, if, we, if Trump does get impeached, we've got Pence. What is Pence? But a more stable, in some ways more dangerous ideologue who's going to follow through on the same things, but more effectively. While Trump is inept, incompetent, self-destructing in an incompetent White House, Pence is in some ways even more dangerous. So we have to think seriously about what our options and alternatives are. Thank you.